Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whenever you are. Welcome to this new format, which is basically going to be a stream of consciousness on various events that have happened as and when I discover them. Now, I'm sure you all heard earlier in the week about the way the Puffin books have decided they're going to edit Roald Dahl. Now, this morning, being uh, Sunday the 26th of February, I came across an article that said that, well, that they were going to change their opinion on that score. And uh, let's just see if I can bring this up for you. There we go. Uh, yes, Puffin have now said that they are going to keep Roald Dahl's story without changes to them. Uh, whether they actually bother to stick with this is a whole other matter. Uh, to be honest with you, I think that the idea of anything that claims to be protecting against any sort of offense or harm uh, that's emotional is a waste of time. Uh, you know, you're never going to create a resilient people uh, if you're going to behave like that. But at the same time, I also discovered that this other story is that they've, they've left Roald Dahl alone, but now they're going to have a go at James Bond instead. Now, the problem I have with this, uh, again, other than just censorship is bad, is that James Bond books were written at a specific time in history, a time where these kind of things were perfectly acceptable. Now, but I think that you know, any kind of change like this is going to be a big bad move. It will affect culture. And there is a, a, a bigger, bigger issue here. Uh, an article from the Expose does a wonderful job of going through it you know, uh, by uh, C.J. Hopkins, The War on Insensitivity, which really does go into some great details about you know, the actual reasons for these selective editings of things like Roald Dahl, James Bond, you name it. Uh, and of course, on top of that, we also had earlier in the week this article, the idea that the Prevent Terror, uh, Prevent Anti-Terror scheme is saying that far right and white supremacy uh, it can be picked up from things like Yes Minister, which was a you know a 70s comedy series about a completely pointless. Uh, position in the UK government being run by a pretty much useless uh, MP who was forever being shot down by his own cabinet ministers and permanent undersecretaries who let's face it are the people that really run the UK government and then uh, things like the thick of it which was about uh, Blair era uh, um, spin doctors and spin doctors were nothing but propagandists essentially but again, they were saying, uh, there's, there's lots of things. You know, yes, Minister, in the thick of it, the Dam Busters movie, uh, the complete works of Shakespeare. Uh, there were even things that said that uh, yeah, we've got Lord of the Rings, Brave New World, uh, Joseph Conrad's a secret agent, Orwell's 1984, and the poems of G.K. Chesterton, for crying out loud. Now, th basically, this is a war on culture. Now, there is, funny enough, a scene uh, in uh, 1984, which I think really beautifully sums up what is actually going on here. And uh, I'm going to let this speak for itself, I think. Let's bring this up for you people. Grenade, nine million Perry Pineapple King Grenade, and 1.4 million lightweight Figured launching anti-tank rocket projectors. How's the new speak committee? Three Working overtime? Butter, Plus big wastages and adjectives. Plus big problem is timing the language to scientific advance. Yes. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. You won't have seen the dictionary, 10th edition yet, Smith. It's that thick. The 11th edition will be that thick. So well, the revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. The secret is to move from translation to direct thought to automatic response. No need for self-discipline. Language coming from here, not from here. Excuse me for intruding. 
But what you're saying is that we should be rid of the last vestiges of Goldsteinism when the language has been cleaned. I couldn't be more in agreement with you, brother. Absolutely. Praise be to our leader and the party workers. You can't say it any better than that, can you? you know, the idea that language is has to be controlled. You know, if you have no words to say anything, then you're not going to think these things. And that really, you know, I think ultimately that's what this attack on uh, classic fiction, uh, classic literature in general, is all about. Well, that kind of ties into something else I wanted to talk about. And uh, it comes from, again, the idea of predictive programming. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to a really good movie by my namesake, uh, Strange Days. Um, I can't really share much of this with you because I only have it on Laserdisc. But this movie involves a world where people have virtual reality uh, plugged directly into their brains and uh, Ralph Fiennes plays a dealer in illicit materials, uh, media, quite often uh, the points of death of individuals. Their memories are taken from right at the point they die and it gives them a kind of uh, illegal drug high as a result. And of course, if we're talking about predictive programming, uh, we've got to mention V for Vendetta. Yes, the film is good, but it, it, it completely misses the point on a lot of things. And of course, in the original book, uh, the character of V was one of the few survivors of a government-sponsored terrorism project, you know, a plan to poison you know, the entire population in order to bring in martial law, a new system of government, and of course these people that took over already had control. They already had what they wanted in place. Uh, they had the cure. They had a vaccine for the virus that was killing children. And it's, in a lot of ways, it really does, you know, it, it almost, you know, 40 years before it happened, told you what was going to happen uh, during the scandemic. Another piece of predictive programming I want to talk about comes from another of my favorites, Watchmen. Um, in issue two, I'm just going to see if I can find this again before we quickly, the comedian who, of course, those of you who know the film and the story, um, dies right at the beginning. And uh, it's a bit of a mystery as to why this ex-superhero is dead. But it all comes back to a scene uh, during uh, chapter two. He goes to visit the guy that was his nemesis, uh, a man named uh, Moloch. And uh, he, can't, he can't believe what's going on. He, he found out about something. If, and I'm just going to read some of the extracts from this for you. I mean, I thought I knew how the world was, but I found out about this gag, this joke. You're a part of it, Moloch, oh pal, you know that? If I didn't... Mm. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, if I thought you did know, I saw your name on the list, you and Jamie Slater, but if I thought you were in on this, I'd kill you, you understand? So he's getting the point. He, he, something has seriously upset him. But this is what it is. Oh, Jesus, look at me, I'm praying. You don't know. You don't know what's happening. On that island, they've got writers, scientists, and artists. What are they doing? Yeah. I mean, what's funny? What's so goddamn funny? I don't get it. Somebody please explain it to me. Yeah. He, he's seen something. He's part of the inside with Ozymandias. He's seen something that's upset him. And it all comes to play right towards the end of the story. I believe it is chapter 12, issue 12, when uh, something really big goes down. An alien attack on Manhattan. You know, center of New York, completely wiped out by this giant alien creature. This is what the comedian saw. Now, this is where Zack Schneider's film really got the ball. For a film that is a spot-on adaptation of this graphic novel, they completely changed that one point. And I think that was because this has been the plan for a very, very long time. And if we skip forward, you know, there's a scene later on 
where they've all gone to uh, Ozymandias' uh, frozen fortress to confront him uh, later on, uh, towards, right towards the end of the story. And uh, Dr. Manhattan is basically having a go at him, telling him that you, know, you, that you really dropped the ball this time. You know, I don't care what your excuses are. There is no excuse for this. But as he's doing so, there's a bank of TV monitors uh, which are giving out the news. And they say that uh, there was utter, utter scenes of devastation, you know, the death toll is in the millions, and uh, it, it doesn't seem possible, it's alien contact, or have they been attacked? And uh, essentially, the world leaders come together and are saying, oh, well, if this was an alien attack, we all need to band together, we need to come together, we need world peace, we need an end to hostilities until we've evaluated this new threat in complete confusion here, end to hostilities, uh, end of the war in Afghanistan is a gesture, yeah, end of the war. And of course, Ozymandias celebrates. He celebrates that he completed his goal. He created a crisis in order to bring about world peace. And all he had to do was betray some of his old friends, kill a million or so people. And what better way to get black and white, east and west to come together than over the idea of fighting some extraterrestrial alien threat. And essentially most of the Watchmen go along with this idea. They believe it's a good thing, they believe it's worth its while, um, but ultimately it's not. You know, you've sold out your principles, you've created a lie. You know, all right, it may have been a lie that did some good, but ultimately it was a bad thing. And this comes back to everything that's happening now. It doesn't matter whether it's 9-11, 7-7, uh, and all these things. You know. It comes back to you know, one of the reasons I think the thick of it got picked out for being listed as a, you know, a, a, a sensitive, you know, far-right thing. In the, the, in the movie, for the thick of it, uh, it's called uh, In the Loop, is all about essentially cooking up the Iraq War dossier. Because that's what they do, is right at the very end, they have to fake the dossier. And I think there's a real reason for things like that. For, because ultimately, if you're going to tell the truth, you better make people laugh. Otherwise, they'll kill you. People don't like to hear bad news. But bad news is here, and it's not going anywhere in a hurry. Right, uh, that's about it for this particular uh, section. Um, I. If you like this format, I will do more. Uh, if you want to hear more on the subject, let me know in the comments below. And uh, I'll speak to you next time. Peace out.